All right, we are on to Laura writing. And the two pieces of hers that we read this week, we are reading Eve's Side of It. That is a short story that she wrote. And her commentary on Eve's Side of It. Yeah, so you get the short story and then you get her commentary. Kind of like when we read uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman, we read the yellow wallpaper and then why I wrote the yellow wallpaper. So we're getting a little of Laura Writing's insights here um, into her story side of it, which is good because it can be really perplexing uh, and different. Um, and it dovetails with a lot of that like mythological writing that was going on. Remember I talked about that in the, in the beginning overview of the later, or yeah, of our, of our um, early 20th century lecture on, um, the life and times, you know, the early 20th century and, and the literature, you know, and there was a, a very renewed interest in mythology and, um, you know, folklore. We see that with, um, of course, Zora Neale Hurston collecting folklore. We see uh, myth and ritual being popularized by um, James Fraser and um, Rick Weston, or I'm sorry, Jesse Weston and, um, in her, yeah, from Richard Romance. And then we also see, uh, you know, um, Jung and Freud, you know, doing a lot of work, uh, or especially Jung, you know, with archetypes. Yeah. Um, so some of that, you know, we're seeing surfacing some of those, those um, interests, you know, and um, popular themes are surfacing in um, an exploration of each side of it in, in this short story. And I won't say too much more. I don't want to have too many preconceived notions on your part. I want you to figure things out. But um, if you look at the written out lecture, there is a large photo of Laura writing herself. Uh, again, wearing, sporting that bob that became so popular in the 1920s. It's funny. We, our first author, Amy Lowell, she's got the long hair and the bun, you know, and then every other one has that very fashionable short bob that became so popular in the 1920s she's wearing that and can't see too much more but you know she's got these these deep set eyes that kind of just like peer into you in this photo so it's, it's it's worth looking at um also in the written out lecture is uh i have several of course links if you would like to know more about laura writing or her works and times um there is a a whole website devoted to her called laurawritingjackson.org and Jackson is um one of so she when she got married that's um yeah her husband Jackson we'll read it we'll talk about him in a little bit um but so you might hear her referred to as either Laura Writing or Laura Writing Jackson um this link features biographical information on Laura Writing from the Jewish Women's Archive um that's the one that's just JWA is from the Jewish Women's Archive um so she was Jewish so yeah that's kind of Interesting to read their perspective. And there's a um, high bandwidth and low bandwidth link to a highly informational documentary on Laura Writing's life and work. You can scroll down to the towards the bottom of the page and click on that link. And then another YouTube video um, has Laura Writing Jackson in 1975 discussing and reading some of her works, including poems, although she reminds readers that she renounced poetry a long time ago. It's funny, she's reading her poems that she renounced. Kind of interesting, yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that too. Her renouncing poetry, even though she had been a poet. Anyway, Laura Writing, she was an American. She lived from 1901 till 1991. She actually died not that long ago. She lived to 90 years of age. Like, literally, I was alive in 1991, as I assume maybe some of you are, or many of you. I don't know <laughs> how old you are, but it's not that long ago in my life. <laughs> I think I graduated college in 1991. So anyway, she was my contem uh, my contemporary. In other words, we lived during the same time period, although she was clearly much older than I was. She was 90 when she died in 1991. Laura Writing was born Laura Reichenthal in New York City to a Jewish heritage mother and an Austro-Hungarian socialist father who hoped Laura would become a modern day socialist like Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, who was a really famous socialist um, from that time period. Laura, Laura, however, attended Cornell University, married history professor Louis Gottschalk, and started writing poetry. 
which was published in the Southern Literary Magazine called The Fugitive, which is a really famous uh, magazine from that time period. Laura converted her surname Reichenthal to writing and assumed the literary name of Laura Writing Gottschalk at that time. As Laura's verse became increasingly popular, she was grouped together with other fugitive and new critics like Robert Penn Warren, Alan Tate, and John Crow Ransom. That was a school of um, literary thought, you know, literary movement at the time period called um, the New Critics School. And the fugitive published a lot of the writings from those new critics. Now, new critics kind of looked at... Um, things in a, in a different way, like sometimes they would look at like, like there's new historicist criticism, which we talked about with our midterm essay, where they would look and try to analyze um, more of uh, what was maybe not written in history or the voices of the, um, the underprivileged and things like that. So anyway, around this time, she divorced her husband and was invited by poet Robert Graves and his wife, Nancy Nicholson, to work with them in England. Like new historicist criticism that might like look at surrounding um, context, uh, new critics or new criticism anal tended to analyze just the work itself. Okay, um, so they very much concentrated on on what imagery was in the text and also um, the language, you know, the word choice that was used, the emotional or intellectual tensions in a work it was very much on focusing on the work as an aesthetic object in and of itself, divorced maybe from the, you know, notions about what the author was going through or about the times that may have informed it or surrounded it or stimulated it. It was very much on what is in this work. Right, and let's let's analyze the symbolism, the word choice, um, the themes, uh, imagery, things like that. So that is what a new critic is, and Laura writing uh, her work appeared um, in the Fugitive, um, along with those other new critics, Robert Penn Warren, Alan Tate, and John Crow Ransom, who were all you know famous new critic poets as well. Um, and and I said at this time, you know, she got divorced, and she was invited by by fellow poet Robert Graves and his wife, Nancy Nicholson, to work with them in England. So she went, Laura went, but in 1929, because of the love triangle that developed among the three, unknown whether Laura actually, whether her relationship with Nancy Nicholson was a love or more of a friend relationship, but she was very close with Nancy Nicholson, but she also had this love relationship with Nancy Nicholson's husband, Robert Graves. So yeah, you know, that's not going to, um, well, unless everybody's on the same page there, but apparently they weren't because, um, Laura attempted suicide by throwing herself out a window and breaking her back. Though she recovered and was able to walk again, which is pretty amazing. She really lucked out that she survived that attempt and survived being able to walk afterwards later on after recovering. Robert and Nancy ended up getting a divorce and Robert and Laura got together and went to live in Majorca where the two collaborated on poetic and literary philosophic theories of the generation of myth and poetry. Again, sounds, you know, again, there come those myths, you know, the myth tones again, um, which you know, we see um, the use of the female myth recurring in writing short story, Eve's Side of It, which she wrote in 1935. Um, now, though writing's commentary tends to downplay feminist um, leanings behind the story's implications, uh, each side of it also features the Lilith character from Jewish tradition. You might not be familiar with Ju Lilith, but um, she she's a figure from from Jewish Jewish uh, tradition and folklore. Um, so you have Eve, you have L Lilith, and of course that would be a love triangle, right? With of course we know Eve's famous husband Adam. So interesting if there may have been some parallels with Nancy Nicholson, uh, Laura. And Robert Graves. Of course, there I'm being the very new historicist critic, like in analyzing, you know, what's going on in the background to motivate this story. And it helped me understand it at all. But the 
new critic would say, nope, we're just looking at what's in the story, right? Um, anyway, um, the love triangle. Oh, sorry. Backing up. Although Laura um, changed her last name from Reichenthal to the less Jewish sounding writing and said she belonged to no church, her inclusion of Lilith from, from Jewish um, folklore suggests familiarity with Jewish story and tradition. Also, the love triangle among Laura and Robert Graves and his wife, whom he divorced via Laura, makes me ponder resonances within his side of it and the stories, characters of Eve and then and then the implied Adam and Lilith. And Lilith is Eve's forerunner, of course. Laura and Robert seem to have had a falling out around 1939 when Laura returned to the United States and renounced the writing of poetry. You know, that's what she had written, right? All that poetry. Um, because, as she contended, poetry interferes with the truth that is supposed to lie behind it. Thus, Laura turned her attention to writing essays and books that explore the nature of language. In 1941, Laura married literary critic Schuyler B. Jackson, and the two settled in Florida. And in the 1960s, Laura started writing under the name of Laura Jackson. That's where that Jackson in the Laura Writing Jackson Society comes from. It's her husband's surname, that, that husband that she married up. The two collaborated on a dictionary that endeavored to revise the inadequacy of language, which makes sense because she's studying the nature of language, right? And she's renouncing poetry because she feels as if its language obscures the truth that lies behind it. In 1989, Laura wrote in a foreword to her own book on language and women that Robert Graves had stolen many of her ideas on women and myth-making. She said that Graves' whole, quote, female principle, unquote, is in his The White Goddess, this book he wrote, had been her idea. The work of Laura's, we read this book, Eve's This Week, Eve's Side of It, features both the female principle as well as women who make myth. So that's an interesting one to read, knowing all of this history about Laura. And, you know, she had said that the female principle was hers, not Robert Graves's. And, and we do see it here in her in short story. So enjoy reading more about Laura Writing's life and times, and of course the work, enjoy it, the short story, Eve's side of it, and commentary on Eve's side of it.